With your Bibles in John chapter 17, we are in lesson number three of our series titled How to Live in This World. How to Live in This World. Church, throughout the Bible, God has taught his people how to live in the world. You can see it with Abraham. You can see it with Moses. You can see it through the prophets. You can see it with Joshua. You can see it throughout the Old Covenant. You can see it in the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus Christ. You can see it in the Paulinian letters. You can even see it in the final book of the Bible, Revelation, which teaches us how to live based on what was, what is, and what is to come. God has never left his people ignorant as it relates to how to live in the world. I have a responsibility as your pastor and as the Episcopal pastor of churches around the world to make sure that I teach the church how to live in this world. And I also have a responsibility to those who have been restored to teach them how to live in this world. It, it doesn't do any good to be healed and repaired and rebuilt and strengthened and equipped and ordered and don't know how to live in the world in which you face. And so for the next several weeks, we're just going to be looking at how do we live in this world? And we're going to be using the words of Jesus as our guide. We know in John 17 here, Jesus is praying to the Father and he's praying for his disciples and he's praying for us. And Jesus here lets us know that he's praying for those who he has called out of the world, but he's not praying for the world. And he's praying that they would have joy. He's praying that they would be protected from the evil of the world. He is praying that they would be sanctified through truth. Jesus is reminding the Father that he kept them while they were in the world that he had to keep those who believed on him because they were hated by the world. And Jesus is praying for his disciples because he is about to send them out into the world. And so in verse number 15, Jesus here says, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe that thou hast sent me. And, and so we see here in John 17 that Jesus desires to send us into the world, that the world might know and believe that he is the Son of God, that the Father sent the Son. Now listen to me, some of us have been in church so long, we have forgotten that we were sent. Some of us have been in church so long that we for have forgotten that we've been sent into the world. Jesus brought us into the body to send us into the world. Jesus didn't bring us into the body to hide from the world. Jesus brought us into the body to be protected from the world, but he had every intent to send us into the world. Listen, the world can't know and believe that the Father sent the Son if we're only in church and not in the world. Uh-oh. The world cannot, because I can just hear your Christian wheels are burning. 
if we never leave out the church, how will the world know that the Father sent the Son? Pastor, are you just, you're going to have to listen to every statement. Now, here's the good news. Jesus didn't send us into the world alone. He said, I I'm going to send you another comforter in the Holy Spirit. He, he told them in John 16 before he prayed, he said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but peace be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. He, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you another comforter. So he didn't send us out into the world by ourselves. Not only did he send us with the Holy Spirit, but he sent us out together. He sent us out together. So to fulfill our assignment, we have to know how to live in this world. And so I had an intent. My intent is to protect us from the evil of this world. You know, oftentimes, Sister Cherry, I, we, we listen to Christian parents, and we can tell when we talk to Christian parents that they don't know the difference between protecting their children from the evil of this world and protecting them from the world. And so they're, they're afraid for their children to do anything. Anything. Talk to anybody or see anything. Because God forbid, that's in the world. But you're not teaching them the most important lesson. Because see, here's the thing. Eventually, they have to leave your house. So you can put six locks on the doors and you can pull the shades and you can only bring them here and take them back and you can do all of that, but you can't stop them from aging. And at some point, they got to get a job and get out your house. And they're going to have to live in this world. So instead of hiding them from everything out of fear, Maybe I need to teach them how to be protected from the evil since they got a function in the environment. Pastor. Hang on. I can hear your Christian wheels turning. But I thought we were going to train up a generation untainted by the world. Yes, untainted by the evil. Protected from the evil but not, exposed, not unexposed to the, its existence. Uh-oh. Well, Pastor, how do you do that? Deuteronomy 6 told us, Deuteronomy told us how to do that. You keep them with you while you go out in the world. And while, you walk by, while they walk with you, you teach them. When they wake up, you teach them so that they can be protected from the evil. This is going to be so much fun. Now watch this. But if, if a church has a congregation of believers who don't know how to live in this world, that church will die. If a church has a congregation of believers who don't know how to live in this world, that, that church will die. It will die one of three ways. It will either die from age, meaning everybody in there will just stay in there till they die, and there's nobody left. It'll die through loss of vision, meaning it will forget why it exists, or it will die from corruption. It'll stop being sanctified and eventually invite the world in to try to keep the doors open. And it's my job to make sure this church doesn't die. That's my job. That's my job. Amen? And that's your job. You don't want the church to die, right? All right, so we got to do our job. So my intent is to protect us from the evil of this world. Now... 
When I say the evil, I'm talking about protecting us from things that are damaging to our character. Don't you want to be protected from things that are damaging your character? I, I want to protect us from things that are hurtful. You know, part of the reason we spent so much emphasis on restoration is because so many people have been hurt by the evil of this world. And I want us to be protected from things that are grievous. Grievous to God. You know, it may not be grievous to you, but it's grievous to God. I, I want to protect us from the malicious intent of the adversary. My purpose, or the purpose of this teaching, is to sanctify us with truth. To sanctify means to separate from evil things. I, I want to separate us from, now see, don't get hung up on what you think I'm going to take away. What are you going to say we can't do? Evil things is what I'm going to say you can't do. I, I want to purify us. I want to cleanse us on the inside. I want us to be set apart for a sacred purpose. The goal of this teaching is to actualize our vision in the world in which we live. I want to actualize our vision in the world in which we live. See, he, here's the thing. The vision of this church is to be a church that loves God, hates sin, and what? Loves to give. Now, we have to know how to do that in this world. And, and before you think that this world is just, you know, worse than it's ever been and, oh, it's just terrible and how can we do that, listen, listen, Nobody's being thrown to the lions. Paul had to teach believers how to love God, hate sin, and love to give at a time where they were being actually, literally crucified. And yet, they managed to live in that world in such a way that now we know who Jesus is. So if they could live in the times in which they lived and glorified God, we can glorify God in the times in which we live, but we need to know how. Amen? In other words, we have to move the church forward in this world. In other words, we can't wait for the world we want to do the work of the Lord. We have to move the church forward. God wants the church to move forward in this world, in the world in which we presently live, God wants the church to move forward. And you know what happens? You know, the longer you live, the, the more you think that the will of God can't be done in the time that you're in. That's just true. In other words, when you got saved, you believed that the word of God and the will of God could work in your time. But then when times change, you look out and say, boy, in the times of day, I don't know how anybody could be a believer. The same way you were a believer. Now, I, I did an interesting thing. I was, at, I was at a ministerial training. I think I'm going to do the same thing that I did at ministerial training here. So I think it's going to be interesting. I, I did a little survey at ministerial training, and uh, we had about 70 or so people there, and I did a little survey. I asked a question. How, how many people in that ministerial training either dedicated or rededicated their life to the Lord between 20 and 35? So I'm going to ask the same question tonight. If you're in here and you either dedicated or rededicated, you know, came back from vacation. Either, if you either dedicated or rededicated your life between the age of 20 and 35, I want you to raise your hand. Now just look around. Just look around. And hold them up high and let everybody look around. Hold them up high and everybody look around. Take a good, hard look. Now with your hand still up, if you dedicated or rededicated your life before the age of 20, Add your hand with those that are already up. If you de now take a good look around. Take a good look around. Nearly every hand is up in this place. You can put your hands down. So then 20 to 35 is the age that people seek Jesus. So if we're not seeking people at the age people are seeking him, what are we doing? There's, there's clearly a window. 
when young people or people, humans, seem to be looking for God. And it seems to be somewhere between 20 and 35. So if our focus is not in the time in which God taps the heart of men, what are we doing? All I'm doing is asking you to find people who are like you. I mean, this, we have made a simple assignment ridiculously complex. Well, how are you going to reach them? How are you going to, well, how did somebody reach you? What got to you? See, we, we, we've, allowed, uh, we've allowed what we see to become more powerful than what we know. And yet we call ourselves people of faith. But we've allowed what we see to become more powerful than what we know. Now listen, we're in a time of change because of the world in which we live. In other words, the reason there's change in the church is because of the times in which we live. And we have, now, if I ask the second question, how many of you are currently between the age of 20 and 35? Raise your hand. Now take a good look around. 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 You all can put your hands down. About 10%. So what are our hands telling us about our church? And the effectiveness of the work we're doing. We need our hands to speak to us tonight. In order to say something to you. Now, now here, here's the thing. There are a lot of us who have allowed the world to intimidate us. But for those who are between 20 and 35, they're excited about the opportunity to go out into this world and represent who they believe. See, we, we, even, we're even, we even hear this teaching different. Those in this generation saying, are saying, yeah, give me the equipment. I'm ready to go. Pastor, I'm going to be here because if you tell me how to go out there and handle myself in this world, I'm going to represent Christ. But guess what? That's how we were. That's how these seats got full. So we have five objectives, or six objectives, excuse me. I want to teach us what is the world, what is the world in which we live. I want to teach us how to be sanctified with truth. I want to teach us how to live in this world, how to do the work of the ministry in this world, and how to protect the next generation from the world. And so we started last week with our first objective, what is the world? And I said there were seven definitions. I think I gave you, taught one, and told you the second one, right? So the first definition of the world is the whole of creation created and ordered by God and defiled by man. The whole of creation created and ordered by God and defiled by man. And we made some statements, and I want to go back through them quickly. First of all, we said the world is not random. It didn't order itself. See, that's, that's evolution. That, that somehow the world was random and it ordered itself. Now, now, most of us don't believe in evolution, but we do believe in the random nature of the world. 
that somehow the world is dictating the world. But the world did not order itself. It was ordered. We said that man did not order the world. See, during the time of Greek philosophy and uh, Roman philosophy, the birth of knowledge and the awakening out of the dark ages, man began to think that through knowledge we ordered the world. And that atmosphere still exists in the earth today, that somehow man orders his own world. That's why expressions like find your own truth. There is a truth, and you don't own it. Now, now watch this. With, with the advent of faith teaching has come the adoption of the philosophy that man orders his own world. Because faith teaching has stopped teaching the rightly divided word of God, they've even stopped referencing the scriptures altogether. They just say, you name it, you claim it. You believe it, you receive it. In other words, you, you are ordering, you are creating the reality in which you live. You tell the world what to do. You tell, you speak what you want to happen. I say it and it happens and it happens the way I say it's going to happen because I said it. Well, well, you don't order the world. You don't order your world. The world, well, Pastor, what about, we're going to get to it. Don't worry about it. We walked through the scriptures last week. We learned that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that what we see was framed by what we don't see. See, the, the world is and will always be shaped by the Word of God. The world is and will always be shaped by the Word of God. Now, this is where I got to back up, Sister Cherry, before I go forward. Make sure we all clear. Because there's confusion in here about the difference between free will and God framing the world. There's confusion in here about the difference between free will and choice and God framing the world. And see, so you, you basically have uh, a couple of different beliefs in Christendom and neither one is, neither one is exactly accurate. You, you have Christians who believe that God determines everything so it doesn't matter what you do because no matter what you do, what's going to happen, God's already determined it. Then on the other end, you got folks who God gave you the power to say whatever you want. And everything is in your life is going to be what you say and not what his word said. And neither one of those is accurate. There's an aspect of truth in both, but they're not true. So what most Christians do is land somewhere in the middle. We don't know when God did it or when he didn't do it, when he should do it or when he shouldn't do it. When, when it was him or when it wasn't him. Come on now. We don't know if we did it, God did it, the devil did it, the world did it. So we just say praise the Lord. <laughs> so let's try, before I go forward, let's make sure we're clear. The world is the whole of creation created and ordered by God and defiled by man. The worlds were framed by the word of God, right? So how does that tie into my ability to have choice and my will? If God framed it, then it doesn't matter what I choose if I don't understand what that means, okay? So watch this. The worlds were framed by the word of God. In his framing, he gave you a will and the power of choice. But what he didn't give you was the power of consequence.
He only gave you free will and the power of choice. But he didn't give you the power of consequence. Or another way of saying it this way, he gave you the power to do addition, but not the answer to the problem, what it equals. So you, you have the ability to choose. You have free will. You can live your life however you want. But what happens as a result of how you live is framed by God. So the frame, because he also framed the fact that you have a will. Oh, well, Pastor, I don't understand. Okay. I have set before you life and blessings and death and curses, Deuteronomy 6. Therefore, what? Choose life so that both you and our seed may live. Now, watch this. If a sinner chooses life, his seed is blessed because his life is framed by the word of God. If a non-believer sins, it hurts his children. He doesn't have to be a believer, and he doesn't even have to know it's in the Bible. His life is framed by the word of God. That which is done in the dark, what? It's framed. That if you do it in darkness, light's coming. It didn't say Christians. Now the world says it this way, your deeds are going to find you. Because they don't know the Bible. But it's framed. Whatever, whatsoever a man sows, that's true of every man. And everything. Whatever it's so, whatever you sow. Are y'all following me? Now the world calls it karma. You're gonna get it as good as you gave. But we understand, see, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. See, didn't take your choice away. But you never had the power of consequence. God, God framed it. A tree is known by the... You're known by your works. See? The only thing you can do is what? Make the tree good. The wages of sin is... It's framed. See, it's all framed. Now, we tend to look at all of those scriptures from a negative connotation because we're carnal. But if you're a good tree, you got good fruit. If you're righteous, you, bear, you don't have to deal with the wage of sin. If you sow life, you don't reap corruption. Are you following? Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What the world does is put a rating on something. It's not good for you to see this. Why? Because they don't want it in your heart. Why? Because they know what gets in your heart will show up in your conduct. So the world, because they don't understand, they say PG-13. In other words, this can go in your heart at 13, not 12. <laughs> see, at 12, if this goes in your heart, really bad. But we think by 13, this could probably go in your heart and you can handle it. 